My issue with 20 degrees is it's the top end I'll ever let a system be. My personal opinion as to why somebody like Copeland recommends that is, one, they've designed to that, right? So they, they've factored that in. A scroll compressor, for example, when we really get down to the details, isn't going to start truly overheating or having heat issues until you break 30 degrees. But you're losing a lot of efficiency out of that system. Now, most people, a lot of technicians over the years at least, don't understand these systems well enough to balance them in the way that we do many times. And so where our target most of the time is 10 to 12 degrees, maybe 15 on the top end on majority of our systems, and if we don't see less than 15, a lot of times we're not very happy. And that comes down to purely efficiency, and I don't recommend on a standard system going below 8. I never have a target for 8, but if I'm running 8.59 degrees, I'm not going to fret about it either as long as I know that system is maintaining. Now I can tell you, a lot of the older semi-hermetic compressors, you got, uh, you got above 20 degrees, you would start having serious heat issues. Copeland, um, yeah, uh, Carlisle, there we go. Carlisle 06Es, 06Ds, they did not like those superheats. Uh, yeah, you run 25, 30 degrees on one of those, you, you're gonna tear the valves up in it. And you're going to walk up to it and you're going to see the heads all cooked and crusted because you're running too high a superheat. It needs that additional cooling. As long as you're between 10 to 20, you're okay. If I'm intentionally trying to tune or balance the system, I'm going to target that 10 to 12 range. If I can hit that 10 and 12, I am perfectly happy. Because what's interesting is we just did a system it was, was it 12 or 15? 15. It's 15. They recommended 15 by the manufacturer. But again, you go back to Copeland Scroll, which is what these were, recommendations, they don't want you to go below 20. But the manufacturer told you to go to 15. So who's right? Who's wrong? It's a lot of safe zone to where if you set it up for that, uh, in the way that they intentionally designed their compressors, it's not going to, uh, it's going to be a lot harder to get low. Because that compressor will live a whole lot longer running warm or hot than it's going to run running too cold. And what I mean by too cold is it trying to suck in liquid. It ain't going to run very long that way. So they have to create parameters and recommendations for lack of technician training and lack of your understanding. Subcool, what about subcool? 8 to 12 under what conditions? The most perfect answer is what is their comfort level? Are they comfortable at 70 with a 50% humidity? Or are they comfortable at 75 with a 50% humidity? So what is their comfort level? The reason I'm taking it to that comes back to the load itself. Because, again, if you're trying to charge this system uh, after it got warm, or say you're walking up to it and it's, it's been down for a day or two, it had, a, it had a, a contactor failure. You replace the contactor, you turn it on, it's 80 degrees in the space, but they want it to be 72. You crank it up and you're running, you should be running a 15 degree split on your condenser saturation, but instead you're running 20 degrees and instead of having a 12 degree subcooling, you're pushing 15 to 18 degrees of subcooling. Well, that starts raising questions, or it should. Why am I running this high? Do you know the answer? You got a heavy load. That's all it is. Because you can make that system operate at the readings you want, subcool and saturation on the condenser, 
if you were to set it up to run at an 80 degree indoor. So you have to be careful with those two numbers. They're completely variable on the indoor load conditions. And you have to think about that anytime you're looking at that charge. The superheat should be consistent. The, the evaporator saturation will be fairly consistent. You need to be within a few degrees for the final readings. But that subcooling is going to completely depend on what that evaporator is doing. Because it could very easily look over or undercharged real fast, depending on how far away from what they're asking it to do. And most technicians never even think about this. They fill it up, slap it up, and run on. So if they were charging the system at that high load, it's going to look maybe slightly undercharged by the time it gets down to their set point. Now, I don't know that it would go to that extreme, but it's possible. I mean, yeah. If it's in that poor condition as a whole, it's possible. It could freeze. Normally, you just, you're going to be, if you had 10 degrees at that 80, you might only have four or five by the time you get down to 72 of subcooling. And so now you're creating a scenario where the system has a hard time maintaining on a hot ambient day because they charged based off of a high, ambient or a high indoor load. So be careful using subcooling. It is 1,000% necessary and needed. But be careful how you use it. A push-pull recovery. We actually had a scenario today where this could have uh, helped the on-site tech if we had to practice this. And this is something that, especially dealing with high-pressure refrigerants, 410A, prime example, you, even though you're not having to move a lot of weight, it gets so bright and hot on the roof, this might help you in your recovery. In this particular case, we didn't have any water available. We only had 12 pounds to move, but in a matter of hours, because the tank would get so hot and it would build pressure, we could only move barely seven or a little over seven pounds in an, in an afternoon. So we've got our condenser and we have our line set going out. Wherever it goes, doesn't matter. So this is your liquid line and suction line. This obviously is a split system. It doesn't matter if this is RTU, split, whatever design and setup it is. When you do a recovery like this, uh, you want to hook the suction port of your uh, 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 recovery machine to the liquid line. So we're going to pull off of the liquid line, come into our recovery, Coming this way. Then we're going to go, uh, oop, nope, damn it. Chris, I know you're watching. <laughs> recovery tank is what I meant to say. Going into the recovery tank on the liquid port. Okay? You're going to come out of the liquid line into the tank on the liquid port. Then on the vapor port, you will come back out into your suction of the recovery machine. Uh, yeah. This is our RM recovery machine. Then we're going to go back out the, the discharge port. And we're going to come right back over to the suction. This is a push-pull method. What is happening here is 
we're drawing the vapor off the top of the recovery cylinder and don't trust the colors because the colors will fool you. I just had a tank last week. No, it was the blue was liquid and it said it and the red was gas. <laughs> Somebody had fun with that one. Anyway, we're, so the, the goal is the, where you're going to generate the most heat is during the liquid phase of this recovery. So what we're trying to accomplish is we want to draw all the liquid into this tank, but not build pressure on it. So we're pulling the vapor back off the top of the tank into this, the recovery machine and pushing it back into the system. And what that'll do is that helps push this uh, vapor that has gone through this, the recovery system will help push that liquid back to this liquid point. And what you will do is you'll be able to draw all the liquid out. Which So say we had a 10-pound system. Probably seven, seven to eight pounds of the recharge in that system is liquid. The other two to three pounds is the vapor. If you practice this, you won't generate the heat in your tank and it won't get hot and build so much pressure on you. It'll maintain that neutral temperature or whatever ambient it is around it. If you've got the sun blasting it, obviously that sun's going to heat the metal up. But the point is, if you can keep this in the shade, you can keep this at ambient. Eventually, once you get all the liquid out of it, which you can tell by watching the scale, so that scale, once it, it's going to be rapidly inclining while the liquid phase of that recovery is happening. When you get to the point where that scale begins to crawl, or basically stop, you're down to just pure vapor at that point because all you're doing is you're just moving vapor through. You're not actually adding any more refrigerant directly to the can. So when that scale just halts, you're there. And then you would set up like a normal recovery and just pull the rest of the vapor. And instead of trying to pull all 10 pounds or push all 10 pounds into this can and generate all that heat of compression, you moved seven pounds into this can and generated no heat of compression because there's no compression there. And then you're, uh, then you're able to just recover the little bit of vapor that's left. It's great for 410A because it has so much pressure. Your G5 twin recoveries are going to trip out at 400 PSI. Which for 14A doesn't take long to get there. The initial complaint, and then you need to ask for your readings and what you want. AC is not cooling. What do you need to know? Yep. <laughs> so you walk in. You hear the the blower running. You got air out the vent. You walk outside and condenser fan motor is spinning, compressor is running. And the, um, the liquid line is very warm to the touch. So what else do you need to know? Keep in mind these are, well never mind. What, what do you need to know? Blower is running, condenser running. You're going to hook up gauges in all these scenarios, by the way. Okay. I'm going to pause there. Why do pressures matter? Pressures and temperatures. The rest of the lifeblood of the system. The lifeblood of the system. They correlate because of what? All right, PT chart. Other than knowing what refrigerant it is, should pressures matter anywhere beyond that? 
What matters more, the pressure or the temperature it represents? The temperature. The temperature. My point is... But they're hand in hand. I mean, they wouldn't matter yeah. what refrigerant you were dealing with. If you walked up and it's hot, you're under high pressure the for that refrigerant. Temperature is the temperature is the temperature. The refrigerant, R12, 410A, 22, 134, oh, don't mean anything. The pressure is only a tool to get you to the temperature. So don't worry about the pressure. Focus on the temperature. So in these scenarios, I'm not going to give you a refrigerant because it doesn't matter. It works the same. All right. Uh, let's see. We got. So you wanted what? What do you want? What readings do you want? Temperatures. What temperatures? Sat temps. All right, sat temps. All right, so your condenser sat is 80. And your evap sat, that's not what I should have wrote. There you go, is uh, 20 degrees. What's our outdoor air? Outdoor air was. 80. OAT, 80 degrees. Uh, you gotta have a condenser set higher than the outdoor air. You should, shouldn't you? You're under charge, under pressure. Do you know or are you guessing? Well, at this point, with just those numbers, I'm guessing. Okay. It's, it's pointing me in a direction. All right, pointing you in a direction. Okay, that's good. You're not diagnosing, you're trying to figure it out. That's the point I'm making, is we don't guess. We need to know. So what do you need next? Further diagnosis required. <laughs> <laughs> All right, PM guy. <laughs> at that point, I'm looking at uh, subcool superheat. OK, subcool superheat. Uh, your liquid line is 80. Subcool. Zero. Suction line was whatever down seventy. Superheat is uh, fifty. Huh? You're under charge. Wait. My immediate, my immediate looking at that looks under charge. I said that. Did I say that right? I didn't say that right. I technically said that backwards. Oh, I said that right. Super heat, 50, 20 degrees. Yeah, what am I saying? Anyway, undercharge? That's where I would go with that. Why? Why is it undercharge? <clears throat> well, you got low condenser sat, because we've got low pressures, which aren't important, you know, but uh, uh, you have a low condenser sat, you have a low Evap sat, you have a high sub or a low sub cool, high super heat. No -cool. As you, I mean, as you add refrigerant to that system, that sub cool is going to come up, that super heat's going to come down to our desired range. And as you add refrigerant, you're going to bring that condenser sat up. It's just all about balancing numbers, right? Everybody agree? Anybody see anything different? Anybody want to know anything more? I mean, you got more information. Let's have it. After all, your progress. Is this a trick question? Why? Well, no. Those... <laughs> Does everybody agree? Well, let's run through the scenarios. How do you know what it's not? This should be part of what you do mentally as part of your troubleshooting process. So you believe it is low charge. It's all right. How do you know it's not airflow? Because if you increase, if you were to increase airflow, you're just going to increase the superheat. All right. So increase airflow, increase superheat. Um, what if you decrease airflow? Decrease you decrease airflow, you're going to drop in sat temp. That's right. You decrease airflow, you decrease saturation. So you lower your superheat, maybe, sure, but you also lower your saturation, which is too low. Right? Okay, we ruled out airflow, not that. 
How do you know it's not the metering device? Because again, uh, it's, it's, it's about how well this evaporator is picking up heat, right? So why couldn't it be the metering device? Because if the metering device was overfeeding, you would have a higher evap sat. Right. Overfeed, higher sat, and uh, saturation increases, and what else changes? They're clean. Overfeeding, so you're going to bring up your evap set, and you're going to drop your condenser set because you're not building pressure. Not so much. Focus less on that. What's going to happen to your superheat? Drop because you're gonna right, you're going to do more than drop. You're going to flood. Yeah. So we, we definitely don't have a flooding condition. Is the point. Yeah. So we know it's not an overfeeding valve. What about an underfeeding valve? How do we know it's not just not feeding enough? What would you see different if it was underfeeding TXV? I wouldn't think because it's all going to be gas as it goes through. Well, no, you would have superheat because it's just cold. There you go. Your, uh, what would be different? Your, well, if you were underfeeding, you're going to lose evap sat, right? Right. So, which is what we have. Evap sat dropped. Superheat's high. Why can't it be a bad TXV? Because you're... Can it, your condenser set is, I would say, it's too low. I feel okay. like the metering device is causing a restriction if it's mm -hmm. like feeding, so, which well, is going to bring up your set temp on your condenser side. Yeah. You, you're on point, yes. Saturation, while it may not run high, it's going to bring up. It's going to be higher. You're not going to run a neutral saturation, and typically your liquid line will run right at saturation, or I'm sorry, ambient temperature. Because again, we don't have a lot of load on the evaporator, so there's not much load, but even without the load, because this, this is our indicator of our, of our load coming back, we don't have much load, but we have... Uh, elevated condenser saturation and our liquid line is running a lot of times neutral to uh, ambient temperature. So, so you still no, you would have subcool at that point. The point is though, you can rule out that those are not the readings you would get with an underfeeding valve because the condenser readings aren't where they should be. We've chased that far enough. The answer is you are correct. This is an undercharged system. My point behind that exercise was why is it not the other things? And we have to work through that process. Why is it not this stuff? What time, what's our time? Seven. Okay. Uh, we can work through at least one more. All right. This complaint is uh, air conditioner runs, but it is, it's not comfortable. It's not keeping up. It never shuts off. Never shuts off. It's uncomfortable. What do you need to know? Okay. So we got 30 and 100. We have a 90. And what did I say? Yeah. Oh, yeah, duh. 10. I don't know what I'm thinking there. Start figuring in glass, Doug. 
55 and 25. Yeah, I didn't even. We'll get into glide next class. Okay, these are your readings. Outdoor. Outdoor was 90. So if you're not sure what it is, start ruling out what it's not. Well, it's not undercharged. Not undercharged? Why is it not undercharged? Uh, some cool super heat look good. Well, yeah. my evac sat's a little lower than I wanted. My outdoor, my condenser sat's a little lower than I wanted as well. So condenser sat's low, evap sat's low. You're happy with sub cool, you're happy with super heat. What's my indoor tip? Indoor temperature. Return air is 78. And supply air is 65. Yep. So we know we have load. Okay, so you're not looking at low ambient, you're not looking at yep, no. uh, light load indoors. Right, no low ambient, um, not underloaded. So we've got we've got load where we need load. Good line. Okay, so your metering device. I mean, you said last time that when you have an underfeeding metering device, that your outdoor air, your liquid line are going to pretty much flatten out. So, why is is it a is it too much airflow? We have too much air. No. No. Why is it no? no. That's right. EVAP saturation is low. Is it not enough airflow? Saturation is low. So. That's right. Low superheat. So superheat's high by our standards. Saturation is low. So it's not high or low airflow. It's something outside of that. Yep. We've eliminated airflow. I wouldn't say it's undercharged because if you charge it up more, your sub cool is going to come up. Yep. And your super heat's going to go down, which we want the super heat to go down, but we don't want a whole lot more sub cool. Yep. So based off of the sub cool and the load, we know that it's probably not a charge issue. It's very not not likely. So what else? Okay, so metering device. So what are we dealing with? What, what's, what's wrong with a metering device? They want to know if it's too humid. Too humid. Oh, okay. I didn't include that. Um, 78. Let's say we got a 45 RH. 45 RH. Good question, by the way. Yeah, sorry, guys. It's all good. Overfeeding is going to give us a. Yeah, high so, evap so sat. overfeed, yep, evap sat goes up, and what else? Uh, super heat. Super heat goes down. That's right. We have the opposite of that. So it's got to be under. Why? Well, uh, I would say underfeeding. That temp's going to go down. You're over, yeah, underfeeding, yep. Sat temp's going to go down, which we have a low sat temp. Yep, sat temp's Super low. Superheat's going to go up. Superheat's high. Because it's pulling, it's, it's all vapor, it's pulling more heat. And we've eliminated airflow, we've eliminated charge. That leaves us with metering device. We know it's not overfeed, 
it is an underfeed valve. It's not feeding properly. It's not dramatic, but it's not working right either. All right. Let's see if you can figure this next one out. This next one's <clears throat> this next one's going to be a bit more challenging. That's why I said I'm <laughs> All right, so we got 75. We've got uh, 55 supply. Uh, we've got, let's see, 140, 120. This would be. 20 degrees, ambient is 100, and we have uh, 45 sat, 55 liquid line, and a 10 degree superheat, a suction line, sorry, 10 degrees, 55 suction line and 10 degree superheat. All right, now the complaint. It's uncomfortable. System runs for a long period of time. We hear funny noises outside. Okay. My first guess, because we have a high condenser set, we have a high EVAP set, we have a high soap cool and a low superheat. As you increase charge, your sub cool comes up, your super heat comes down generally. Uh, EVAP sat's too high, condenser sat's too high. We should be looking at like right about what? 15 to 25 above outdoor air? It's not dealing with the one to the condenser sat at 120, right? It, it, 150, outdoor air, about, I guess it would depend on the, you know, we're talking about like micro Right. Well, so let's, we're, just, most most systems today, you're talking a 15 degree on the condenser. 15, okay. 15 is this is the standard. Maybe 20. Yeah, I, I yeah. Know that's subjective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Not most of the systems that ran 30 plus aren't around anymore. Right. <laughs> Except for some. <laughs> Yeah. So you're thinking overcharge. Uh, right off the bat, I mean, I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't dig too far into it, but I'm looking at a high condenser set, a high EVAP set, a high sub cool and low superheat. The superheat's not really low. The superheat's where we want it. I mean, it's close. Um, you got a 20 degree split. Okay. You are correct in the fact that this can very much look like an overcharge. So, what we'll do, let's say you removed some charge, or say you completely recovered and we went back with a factory charge. All right. Uh, or actually, yeah, you go back with factory charge in this particular case. You get the same readings even after confirming factory charge. That's what it would be. Sorry. Okay. Um, too much airflow? Hmm? Yeah, from dryer? Uh, you take a drop across the dryer. Dryer drop is one degree. So not a dryer. And you're at factory charge. You don't have too much fan speed because we, our superheat Increasing load if we had too much fan speed, right? Yes. Oh. Yes. So, so yes. We do have a high set. Well, it's 45 high. Most a lot of. Yeah, I would say 45 is acceptable. I'm fine with 45. 
But again, most coils are actually designed to run at 45. This one is outside of the box, but... What is the uh, uh, temperature is on the, uh, I guess you got 110 to 140, but uh, airflow over the uh, condenser, so delta over the condenser. Condenser split. It'd be, it'd be 40 degrees across the condenser. Approach, uh, uh, outside air is 100, so it's 140. Yeah, be, be 40 degrees. And again, this is a standard system by today's standards. So, <laughs> you're on, you're on I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't resist it. This is a standard system with a 15 degree target condenser split. You're under a high load. Are you under a high load? 100 degrees outside. You got 100 degrees, 75 return. That's a decent load on both sides of the coil. You've got load. Yeah. I wouldn't call it high load, but you have load. Oh. Definitely don't have too little. Yeah. Well, I mean, but with a, high load, with a higher load, you yeah. should expect a little bit of high condenser sat, a little bit of high EVAP sat, a little right. bit of high reading. I'm going to give one extra clue. The, there was another technician here last week, worked on it, and I don't remember what he did, but it was something with the outdoor unit, and it's only kind of worked since then. It's still not comfortable. Our set point, our set point is 73. Is your capacitor good? Is the fan spinning in the correct direction? What fan? Who said that? That would be Kirk, of course. The answer. No. It is not. It's spinning in the wrong direction? So you're introducing heat to your coil. Somebody replaced the capacitor and mistakenly reversed the start and run. Reversed direction on the fan motor. I feel like I should have been up. That should have been like right off the bat. <laughs> you would think. It's sucking air into the condenser. You, you uh -huh. would. No, but that's the thing. When you're walking up to a call, this happens. It may not be very often, but it happens. And sometimes it's easy to switch two legs because you're just in a hurry. You got five more calls to get to. You, you just, you're trying to get through here and get gone. Right? And then this callback comes through, or maybe it was after a PM, and there was an apprentice who just didn't know any better. He hadn't done that yet, because all of us do it eventually. Mm -hmm. And this, these are the conditions you're going to see. And you would think it'd be obvious the condenser fan's not spinning the right way. But I can tell you, my personal self, the first couple of times I ran into this, actually I remember the first time I ever saw it, blew my freaking mind. I could not make sense. It looked overcharged. I'd pull charge out. It wouldn't correct. It was constantly high. I could not get the high side to stabilize and it would run, 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 and eventually trip out on high head and shut down, and then reset and trip out and reset. And, you know, it was going through this vicious cycle at the condenser. And eventually, I just, I was standing there with my hand on it, and it slaps you like a freight train. Why don't I feel air? What, I mean, the fan's spinning. Why, why in the hell do I not feel air? Well, you, you get down and look and you realize, yeah, it, it's spinning backwards. 
Or even if it's not a capacitor, maybe somebody, maybe the last technician, he didn't change the capacitor, he changed the fan motor. And he forgot to switch the rotation legs because he wasn't thinking about it. Again, he's in a hurry. It's a very easy mistake to make at any level. I don't care what your experience is. And if you're not paying attention, it'll, it'll rock your day. Anyway, good job online. Next month, we're going to dive deeper. We're going to go more of the advanced side of the refrigeration cycle and get more advanced with how we do controls and EEVs and hot gas bypass and balancing and reheat coils and all of the advanced side of it. This class here was intended to be a entry level refresher of just the fundamentals of what this industry does and what we do and why. So just keep in mind that'll be next month and uh, we'll go from there. Appreciate it everybody.